him being our friend. And for us being his friend. It just kind of dawns on me that you know how blessed we are to have a God that loves us that much. Mm -hmm. That he will actually he's our friend. And there's not too many friends we have in this world that you can truly say is a friend because a lot of things can change in a long time. Mm -hmm. But God never changes. And I'm so thankful that I can tell you that thank you for being my friend. Amen. Amen. Well, we're looking at chapter 7 of Proverbs tonight. If you're going to look at a pew Bible, it's 993. Um, and uh, we, uh, we're we going to do our best to work through the whole chapter tonight, like we've been doing. Um, Clark Stanley is a name you probably don't know. He was a cowboy in the late 1800s from Texas. After he'd been working as a cowboy for 11 years or so, he, he had a course change, and he began studying, according to him, with a Hopi Indian medicine man. He studied with this man for a couple of years, uh, this Hopi Indian from uh, Arizona. From this medicine man, he learned the secrets of snake oil and its restorative properties. Not long after he began sharing this miracle cure, uh, he, he even demonstrated at the Columbian World's, uh, World's Columbian Exposition, which is the Chicago World's Fair in Chicago. He, uh, so like he wasn't just somebody local. He, was, he had made the big time. But in 1916, so this is like 20 years after he'd started, the uh, predecessor to the FDA examined his snake oil, and that's what he called it, his snake oil. And uh, I know you're going to be surprised. They found out that it really was of no medicinal value at all. It contained a compound of mineral oil, some fatty compound from beef, capsaicin, which is the stuff that makes hot peppers hot, and turpentine. <laughs> But he sold a lot of it because people wanted it to be true. His greatest contribution to society probably is the term snake oil salesman. <laughs> aren't you glad that people aren't gullible anymore? <laughs> <laughs> in, in 2022, the FBI reported that Americans that year lost $10.3 billion to scams. Just Americans. Uh, how could that be? But really, how it works out, it's the same story largely because you're presented with an opportunity that you want to be true. Even sometimes when you think that's not true, you want it to be true. And so you go ahead. Uh, there are, of course, in that 10.3 billion, I'm sure there are some victims who get taken in through fear, things like that, or less selfish reasons, but it's still, it continues to be a big problem. But it really doesn't need to be. There's lots of information uh, for us to arm ourselves against it. There's all sorts of information really readily available to a person who wants to be discerning. You don't have to fall for those, those tricks and those traps. I mean, when it comes to scams, I'll just, maybe you don't know this. If you know, I'm not trying to insult you, but you take your phone and you can get Google and you can say, you got the thing that, you know, it's been sent to you and you say is, and then put that thing in, a scam. And you'll find out if other people have already reported that that's a scam. That's, I would recommend that to you highly. In the chapter we're going to study uh, tonight, we're going to see someone who willingly becomes the victim of a scam. They didn't fall victim in ignorance. They had all sorts of information available to them. They'd been taught. They'd been, you know, everything they, every advantage they could have had, they had. All the warning signs were there, but they still sadly became a victim. Now we're looking at chapter seven tonight, and it is, uh, we've seen this once before, organized in this, what they call a chiastic shape because of the word chi, which is a Greek letter, it's an X, so it's an X-shaped form or structure. We've talked about this before. You might remember I said 
It's called an X shape, but it really seems like just part of the X, like the forward arrow. Uh, the sections, uh, the, the sections that are like the prime sections, which I'll tell you about in a minute, are like echoes of the original section. So we'll have an A section, and then we'll have an A prime section, which is similar, okay? So the first part, the A section, uh, that's gonna be verses one through five, and that's a, a call to attention, a call to attention. And uh, specifically here, a call to attention to be protected from this woman that we will learn about. So first A section, verses one through five, a call to attention. Then we have the B section, is verses six through nine. A simple young man wanders. A simple young man wanders. Not simple in like, he was a simple young man. He didn't need much. No, he's simple because he's a fool. Uh, then the third part, letter C, section C, that's verses 10 through 20. And the, in that section, the woman in question is described and quoted. And uh, then the next section is B prime. So like B with a little apostrophe. This is gonna be similar to the other B section. This is verses 21 through 23. A simple young man is slain. So 21 through 23, simple young man is slain. And then uh, the last section is the A prime slain, killed, S-L-A-I-N. Uh, the last section is A prime, so this is an echo of the A up at the top. Uh, this is verses 24 through 27, a second call to attention. Okay, now if you had a, if you got a, uh, a Bible that, you know, you sometimes take notes in, you could go through and, you know, kind of highlight these and you would see that they, they do really sort of bear some resemblance to these other sections, like I've said. Okay, so <clears throat> we pick up in a sense where we left off last week. Let me read the first five verses. My son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live and my law as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your nearest kin, that they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. This sounds a lot, a part of this sounds a lot like what we talked about last week with the uh, keeping the words, treasuring the commands, writing them on your uh, forehead or fingertips and all that stuff. It's very similar. Um, the sage... Here, the person, the speaker, the wise one, he's addressing a son. Is it his own son? Maybe. Rachel and I were discussing this week what we might say to someone who would make the case that verses like this, these verses, well, they're just for boys or just for men. As if someone were to say, well, these weren't written for me. Well, I thought about that a lot, and I think maybe the easiest way to wrap our minds around that idea is to understand that in actual fact, none of the Bible was written to you. None of it was written to me. I, I mean, I've looked, I'm not in there anywhere. Every year I go back, I just, I'm never showing up. It wasn't written to me. But while scripture wasn't written to me, the Bible is absolutely for me. So you can't say, well, that doesn't apply to me. Well, I mean, maybe, but don't be so sure. Don't limit the Holy Spirit from being able to speak to you if he so chooses. I think probably the person that... that uh, <clears throat> doesn't want the Holy Spirit to speak to them, probably isn't bothered a lot by the Holy Spirit. 
Probably. I mean, God, he's not in the not in the business usually of knocking people down to get their attention. He doesn't. So we should always be in a place where the Holy Spirit can make application to us regardless of the, the passage that we're looking at. In a, in a few months, we're going to get to Proverbs chapter 31. I won't be inviting the men to stay home that night. Even though that's the Proverbs 31, it's all about the woman. Well, there's stuff for everybody there, just like there's stuff for everybody here. All right, so the, the, the sage here, the speaker, the proverb writer, he once again speaks to the, the importance and the, uh, of keeping and treasuring the words and the commands of the Father. It's as though he's saying, listen, boy, I'm going to tell you these things I want you to remember. Now, don't forget. I don't know what your dad was like. Maybe you had a bad experience with your dad. If so, I'm sorry. God's better than that. But, I mean, my dad, I had a good dad. I still do. And he repeated himself endlessly. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'll bet you there are people here that can think of at least one thing my dad used to tell me. What would it be? You don't have to say everything. You, you don't have to say everything you think. That's right. I, I, you know that because I've told you more than once that dad said it to me. And you know what? I don't even know how many times he said it to me. It was a bunch. A lot. Not just when I'd messed up. He was always repeating himself. He was saying, well, listen, when you get to what, you know, that's another thing. Dad'd be like, okay, now when you get in this situation, don't forget. So that's what the, that's what the proverb writer is doing here. Okay? He wants you to hang on to these things. We have the words, we now have the words and the commands of our Heavenly Father. And we should absolutely keep those close to us. We keep immersing ourselves in Scripture. We don't read Scripture every day because God's got a chart and puts a star on it for us. We read Scripture every day to stay close to the Heavenly Father. Those are His words. We're listening to him every day when we read the Bible every day. This passage that we're looking at right here actually refers to the whole person. He talks about eyes and fingers and heart. We want to be completely dedicated to this task of paying attention to what God's got to say. The, excuse me. The more we pay attention to what God's got to say, the better off we'll be and the more likely we'll be to avoid the devil's scam, because that's important. The, the uh, wisdom here, he personifies as a woman. He says, say to wisdom, you are my sister. He's pers personifying wisdom as a woman. So no, no nonsense about like the sage here, the, pro the book of Proverbs is misogynist, you know, it's down on women. No, it's not. No. It talks about the wicked woman, but just, he's being specific. They're not all that way, clearly. So he says, draw close to wisdom like a, a good sister. Consider wisdom. Keeping wisdom close at hand and, and close to your heart will keep you from the trouble that the immoral woman or man poses. She uses words to flatter the original language, uh, the original, uh, yeah, the Hebrew language here that in the New King James is translated, um, I can see right now I didn't uh, put page numbers, so I'm like messed up, hang on. Um, oh, she flatters. It is the word flatter, okay? The, the actual word is uh, a word that means slippery or smooth. So she's using words that are slippery or smooth. She's a smooth talker. Again, it could be a man. There's enough sin to go around, right? Uh, Proverbs, we'll see again in Proverbs, the idea of smooth talk, and it never is presented as a good thing. Smooth talk is almost always seen as bad. The, the, the uh, most... The most skilled, smooth talker that ever was. You know who his name is? Satan. Satan. He's a smooth talker. That's the idea. 
All right, look at verse six. For at the window of my house, I looked through my lattice and I saw among the simple, I perceived uh, among the youths, a young man devoid of understanding, passing along the street near her corner. And he took the path to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. I found it interesting in one of the commentaries I was reading uh, that uh, this idea of the person looking out the window at something is a recurring theme in scripture and in other non-scriptural writings of this era. It's a, it's a common <laughs> trope, you might say, the person looking out the window and it almost always is a, a signal that trouble is on the way. When it talks about looking out the window, trouble's coming. So for example, in the book of Judges, Sisera's mother looking out the window, trouble has come already. Uh, in 2 Samuel, McCall, David's wife, looking out the window, trouble follows. In 2 Kings, Jezebel is looking out the window, and trouble comes for her. Uh, and then like in Genesis, it, there's an example of a man looking out the window. It's Abimelech. And uh, he sees, I think Isaac and uh, Rebecca. Uh, so the case is made by this commentator that when you take all of these as examples, this looking out the window is sort of a theme that troubles on the way. And the one looking out here sees a number of youths, a number of young people among the simple. It's not really making the case that to be a young person is by definition to be simple. It's not saying that. It's not the old guy griping at the young guy. It's not saying that. It's saying, I see a whole bunch of young people, and there's a certain subset of those young people that are simple. And again, not like the simple things in life. Not like he's satisfied with just a book. No, it's simple, he's a fool. He's not very wise, okay? Not that he's not very bright, it's not intelligence, he's not very wise. He doesn't apply what he knows, okay? So he sees this, uh, among the youth, he sees this simple, uh, some that are simple, and then he sees one above all the others that's not only among the simple, he's not only in that category, he's devoid of understanding, He's devoid of understanding. This young man takes a path to the house of this woman, not wisdom, the bad woman in this story. He takes the path to her house, and it says it's in the black of night. It's in the darkest part of the night. The uh, Have you ever heard, told your kids, you've been told, nothing good ever happens after midnight? No. <laughs> I don't have I don't have evidence for this that I've looked up, but I I sometimes I do like most people do I think or a lot of people. You look at the newspaper. I don't look at everything. I almost always look at the police stuff. I like to see if I recognize any names. I think a lot of those you'd find out. You could like chart them on a clock. You'd find out lots of them are after you know dark. At the times most people should be in bed. Yeah. So that's what's going on here. Um, the uh, darkness in scripture is almost always associated with sin. Almost always. All right, verse 10. So now those were the introductory bits, you know, like we said. Now we're to the, the heart of this story. There, a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. And I'll just... If you're looking at the Pew Bible, that's NIV. I'm reading New King James. So she dressed like a whore, it says, which always seems like I shouldn't say that out loud, but that is what it says. Okay, that's what we're dealing with. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. At times, she was outside. At times, in the open square, lurking at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him. With an impudent face, she said to him, 
I have peace offerings with me. Today I paid my vows, so I came out to meet you, diligently to seek your face, and I found you. I've spread my bed with tapestry, colored coverings of Egyptian linen. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He's taken a bag of money with him and will come home on the appointed day. Okay. Now, you know you're going to be embarrassed in church tonight. <laughs> Hang on, that's going to get better. <laughs> okay. I, I wonder, haven't we all at some time in the past, hopefully, you know, in the past, like back there, found ourselves getting involved with some situation that we know we shouldn't have, and then we later tried to make the case that, well, I mean, things just happened. I mean, I didn't expect it, and it just happened. This guy, this young man here, he can't make that case. He ended up like he did, not by happenstance. He might have wanted to make the case, that uh, try to make the case that, well, he didn't know that woman was going to show up. But by his actions, he was hoping so. He, in the previous part, he took the path to her house. Well, he's, he's hoping that she's going to show up and then doesn't know what. We'll see what happens from there. But he can't make a case that, well, I just didn't see that trouble coming. The wise person would say, hey, let, let's pump the brakes a little bit right there. <laughs> Don't go down that way. But he does. Then he sees this woman. She's dressed like a harlot or a whore. She has a crafty heart. It's, it's not saying she is those things. She's dressed like that. She has dressed to impress, at least to impress a certain type of person. She's loud. <laughs> I, I, I'll just leave that there. She's loud. Okay? She's not misunderstood. She's not a victim. She's actually a victimizer. She's, she is out to damage. When we study Proverbs, we'll see that um, a wise person practices restraint and is often silent. She's the opposite of that, complete opposite of that. No restraint and loud. This woman is the, just the complete opposite. She is wise, but she's worldly wise. She's not wise in God's eyes. She's street smart, I guess. She's got this poor sap's number from the beginning. She's got him. It, it's like a done deal. She is dressed alluringly. She knows what will be impressed, impressing to this young man? Impressive, that's the word I want. Um, she approaches him and she kisses him. So he's a young man. We'll say he's 20, okay? She's older than that. So here's this 20-year-old man. And Mrs. Robinson comes up and she dressed a certain way. And she smiles at him and bats her eyelashes and she kisses him. So like he's thinking, well, someone's finally taking a good look at what I got to offer. <laughs> she tells him that she's got peace offerings with her because she's made her vows. In other words, she's a religious person. She's been to the temple. She made an offering. She made an, uh, an offering as a sacrifice to God. She throws that out there in case he might be impressed the with the fact that she's religious. And she's obviously a woman of means because of the sacrifice she offered. Because poor people could go to the temple too. They didn't offer a sacrifice. So when, she, when you go and you offer this sacrifice, you, you offer a, a bull or a sheep, you offer this sacrifice, the priest kills the animal, sprinkles the blood on the altar, cleans it, takes the innards, burns that on the altar, 
then takes a piece, of, a chunk of the meat for himself. And then you, the one that offered the sacrifice, you take the rest of the meat back with you. That's yours. So she's saying, I've made my offering and we're fixing to have a barbecue. <laughs> and the regular person in that day, the regular person, they don't get to eat meat very often. And so he's like, this is getting better by the moment here. She's offering him the best feed he's had in a long time. So he's, I mean, this is good. This got to be a great temptation to a hungry person. In fact, the uh, one of the books I read about this chapter was saying that the, the way the story is crafted, he's coming in at twilight, it's as though he's been working all day. And now he's heading back, he's not on his way home, clearly, because he took this detour. But he's been working all day, so he's hungry. So he's gonna go back. And, and ironically, she just got back from one sacrifice, and now she's got her next victim right here in front of her. She's about to uh, make another sacrifice with this guy. Then she tells him, I was hoping to see you here. She appeals it to his ego, knowing that that's going to be a powerful lure. There, she's a scam artist. If he, if his friends had all been there, he would have looked at them and said, "She really likes me." His friends, if they were really friends, they would have said, "You're an idiot. She don't care about you. Not, not because it's you." She tells him that not only is her house ready for him. Her bed's ready. No subtlety at all. She's cutting right to the chase. Well, I didn't understand what she meant. Yeah, you did. <laughs> he didn't have any excuse. She's just laying it right out there. She's perfumed the bed and it lists the spices. You can read about those same spices in the same context in the Song of Solomon. So having cast her lure out, she felt a bite. She sets the hook and all she just reeling him in. She tells him they'll be occupied all night in her plans for him, which usually that would be a young man's boast. And so when she says it, he's like, I heard a song about this once. And now it's going to be me. In case he's got any reservations left, she reassures him of the safety of the situation. In the New King James, it says, my husband is away. He's not home. The actual translation doesn't say my husband. It just says the man. She's like removed herself from the relationship there. The man, not at home. He's gone and he's going to be away for a while. He's on this business trip. He's not going to be back for a while. And you might think, wait, how can she know? How does he know that she's not coming? He's not coming back right away. Well, actually there is a way because earlier we read that it was a, the black of night. It said it was dark and dark and black of night. So it's like the darkest part of the, the night in the darkest part of the month. That's the new moon. There's no moon out. They don't have street lights, so these things matter to them. Her husband is away on a business trip. Travelers had to be careful because of, you know, bad guys out in the way. Think like the Good Samaritan, for example, in that story. He's walking up the way and the robbers fall on him. Okay, so they would travel, they would arrange their travel around the full moon. So it's the lightest part. Well, between the new moon and the full moon is two weeks. So she's like, two weeks, I got two weeks of this. She, she's confident that he's not coming. Okay, all right. So verse 21, with her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately, he went in after her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till an arrow struck his liver as a bird hastens to the snare. He didn't know it would cost his life. This poor fool was doomed from the beginning. He's in way over his head. Well, wait, Pastor, are you saying he's a victim? Uh, the Bible said there's no temptation, but that which is common to man and that he'd make a way of escape. It does say that, yes. However, this dude was the victim of his own foolishness. 
He's walking home. And whichever way home is, he's on a detour right now. He, he went there like, you know, there's this neighbor and she mows her lawn with a bikini on. Really, how do you know that? I'll tell you what, it's made my neck sore, but I was able to see <laughs> around that. Okay, well, I mean, that's what this guy does, only more so. He's going to see what he can see. He's a victim of his own foolishness. We, you can't put yourself in situations that you know are dangerous and then blame God when we find ourselves incapable of making right choices. He should never have gone that way. The, the, if, if a person is or has been a raging alcoholic and they finally get freedom from that, you don't go where the other alcoholics are anymore. There's some things you just don't do anymore. You, you stay away from that. And, you know, I mean, we can be judgmental if we want. Well, this young man should have known better. He did know better. Well, he should have had more self-control. He should have. But he's 20 years old-ish. And here's this woman doing what she's doing. That's a big temptation. And he shouldn't have been there to have to fight that temptation off. I was just looking at the articles and I it's like every picture I every time I turn a page is a picture. Yeah, don't look at that magazine. Turns out there's articles in other magazines. I, who would know? He shouldn't have done that. The sage says, this guy's like an ox, a dumb ox, you might say. Lumbering, lumbering off to the slaughterhouse. She's like, and he's like, uh, he's just going along. Or is like a bird that only sees the bait and not the snare. This, this, specific, this specific temptation might not be anything like anything you deal with. But there is something that's tempting to you. And if you go toward that thing, if you put yourself closer to it with some sort of confidence that you've got that you're going to be okay. Well, I'm, I'm much closer to the Lord now than I used to be. And so I ought to be able to get closer to this temptation that's dumb. I, I know. That's dumb. Don't do that. that that's, that's the way of failure and fall and possible destruction. Verse 24. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths, for she has cast down many wounded and all who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. So the uh, sage wraps up this story, and he says, listen to me. Don't go there. Don't turn aside to her ways, or his ways. Don't stray onto her paths, or his paths. Don't, don't do that. Stay away. He says there, you know, like, her, she's cast down many wounded. It's like she's got the backyard. She's like a serial killer almost. She's got the bar they're buried back there. They're, they're, they're not really buried. Their just lives are wrecked because she's done this many times. Just stay away, he says. Stay away from her. Stay away. Stay away. Stay away. But, but Pastor, shouldn't we, shouldn't we be concerned for our soul? Should, shouldn't we want to witness to her? No, no. You stay away from the woman. You let Sister Bonnie well go witness to that woman. You don't go witness to her. Oh, but I just want to, I want to take Jesus. Now, if you find somebody else to witness to. There's plenty of sinners. You can't possibly witness to them all. Don't go to her. I mean, if I've got a problem along these lines, that probably I don't need to have a ministry to the uh, pole dancers. <laughs> Some of the ladies in the church might want to handle that. that I, like, I'll have to do something different. I can care for their soul from a long way off. 
I just there's some things that just don't make sense and they sound silly when you say them out loud, but we, I mean, that's what this is saying. We have to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. That's, that's, that's our call, not to be wise as doves. And, and No, no, don't mix, don't mix it up. Now, in thinking of this passage and preparing for tonight, I, I was thinking that many of us might feel pretty secure in this area. Well, like that, I just for me. Okay, I mean, that's probably the case. However, I think we should remember what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Therefore, let him who stands, excuse me, let him who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. <clears throat> we can't ignore temptations. We certainly can't ignore that sex is a powerful allure. I mean, look around. <laughs> it's a, it is a powerful allure. And, and not just for those other people. It used to be that if a person wanted to look at pornography and they weren't going to borrow the magazine from somebody else, you know, they, they might have to order the magazine in the mail and hope that it came like wrapped in some sort of nondescript wrapper. Or they would go, you know, to some seedy looking place along the highway that used to be like a Stuckey's, but now it's fallen from grace, and now it's like the lion or whatever those things are called. You know, it's got the, the sign that's about 50 feet tall, lots of parking for truckers. Because that person that owns that place is like this woman, luring people in. Nobody's going to know. No one will know. But God will know. It used to be that, that you'd have to go like that kind of a place. But now, see... It's as close as a phone. Mm -hmm. there, there's an app called OnlyFans. Don't look it up. You're just going to trust me on this. Have you looked it up, Pastor? No. But I know about it. There's an app. And this app, they, that company would like to have you understand that they have all sorts of materials on there. They have musicians on there that do like lessons and things. Probably, whatever. They have sports things, sure. But really, it's a porn site. And that's what it is. It, it, worse than that, it's like a porn site. It's like a homegrown porn site. It's like people upload their own stuff. Sad. From 2018 to 2021, this company, this one company, their compound annual growth rate was 178% or 174%. Now, I don't know what your investments are doing. Not there. Probably not 174%. Mm -hmm. But this one did. In 2022, this one app, this one company, their revenue was two and a half billion dollars. That's a lot until you consider that the pornography industry in general has revenues of almost $100 billion every year. Clearly, this is a problem. And it often starts by an individual just going down the wrong path. Just kind of go, I just want to kill them. I, I, I think there's something going on down there. And they go down that wrong path. It's a scam. It's a scam that promises to give <laughs> something, but it inevitably just takes it takes, it, it, a person goes in, in the image of God, and they're left a shell. It's a bad deal. And it's one that we ought to avoid. All, it, long, not arm's length. Farther away than arm's length. So when we see a chapter like this, yeah, it's easy, I guess, to say, oh, that's, not, that's nothing for me. Well, maybe we ought to consider that the Holy Spirit does have something for you in a chapter like this, even if it's just, listen, fool, <laughs> the person that thinks he stands needs to be careful lest he falls. Every once in a while, we got to think, you know, probably 
If I wasn't careful, I could end up in a bad way. So then you don't click on that thing. Even, even if you kind of think maybe you really are connected to a Nigerian prince, don't click on that thing. Don't do it. And don't go down this wrong path either. Father, thank you for your word to us tonight. And I just want to pray, Lord, that you would help each one of us, help me to keep away from things that we know going in, we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't take even one step in that direction. Make us wise and help us to keep the wisdom you've given us bound to our hearts, tied around our finger, on front of our eyes, Fill our hearts with scripture that we can t say no to those things that would drag us the wrong way and that would only glorify Satan and never you. I pray that you would help each one of us, Lord, to draw closer to you. And uh, we thank you for your word to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming tonight.